What's going on, everybody? Happy Tuesday. Welcome into an all new episode of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am so pumped for today's episode. My very first mock draft of the season, which is always super fun to go through. Tons of trades, tons of surprises. I think you're going to really enjoy it. So buckle in for what should be a very fun ride. Just a couple really quick things before we get there. First of all, I've mentioned this a couple times before, but just a quick reminder. Wisconsin Timber Rattlers, they just announced their roster for the upcoming season. And I'm going to be doing a live Q&A session with the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers on April 19th. $10 $10 gets you access to that Q&A session. It's going to be Pack-A-Day uh, podcast day at the ballpark. I think I'm going to be throwing out the first pitch, so that might be worth it in and of itself just to probably see me make a fool of myself in that regard. And you also get the ticket to the game for the $10 as well. So ticket to the game, Q&A, the whole thing, $10. And of course, you get to see the Timber Rattlers play too, which is fantastic every single time. So uh, awesome deal. And make sure to check that out and support both the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers and of course, the Pack-A-Day podcast as well. I will have links to get those tickets in all of our show notes, whether you're watching on Cheesehead TV, Packer Report, on any of the audio channels or on YouTube, all of them will be in the notes, I promise you. The only piece of news that I really have to go over from a Packers standpoint, Christian Welch's contract is official. One year, $1.21 million is what he will make. It will count less than $1.1 million towards the salary cap, $1,062,059 to be exact. He gets a $20,000 signing bonus, a $20,000 workout bonus, and a $45,000 per game roster bonus. Not $45,000 per game. Each game adds up to that $45,000 that he plays The most dead cap that he could potentially have if Green Bay moved on from him in training camp would be 40,000, 20 for the uh, signing bonus that they gave him, and then up to 20,000 for the workout bonuses, dependent upon how many of those uh, workout bonus, you know, I guess how much of the workout bonus money he earned up until that point. Long story short here, this is a one-year cheap contract. If he's on the team, it's not going to cost him a ton of money. If they decide to move on and grab better players in the draft or undrafted free agency or free agency or however they do it, and Welch doesn't fit into the 53, they can release him, and the most dead cap would be $40,000. So nice, easy, cheap option for Green Bay. Special teams is probably where he's going to have to make his name, and we'll see if he can do anything after that. All right. That's it. No other news or notes today. Let's jump right in to our mock draft. Like I said, there'll be multiple trades, hopefully some surprises along the way as well. So let's go right away with the number one overall pick in the NFL draft. The Chicago Bears select quarterback from USC, Caleb Williams. We're not going to spend a ton of time here. We know this. This seems like a foregone conclusion. I guess I would be about 99.9% sure at this point. Never quite know with the Chicago Bears, but he's going to be the guy I heard this on the athletic football podcast the other day, and it describes perfectly how I've been wanting to phrase Caleb Williams. And I couldn't quite figure out the words and they just did a phenomenal job of it. I did not feel like Caleb Williams was chaotic at USC. And I think that's sometimes like that. He's always, he's a chaotic player. He doesn't play within rhythm. He doesn't do it. I did not feel Caleb Williams was chaotic. I felt like the offense was chaotic. The offensive line did not do a great job of protecting him. I just thought the offense in general was not a very aesthetically pleasing offense. I thought Caleb Williams elevated that offense and that offense let Caleb Williams down. And when he was able to play within, uh, I, I say play within structure, but I don't even necessarily mean due to his own volition of like him rolling out or scrambling. When things went according to plan, he was delivering the ball on time with accuracy He's a tremendous player. He's arguably my top quarterback that I've ever graded from a draft standpoint. And he's, he's ridiculously fun. And I hate that he's going to be a Chicago bear. This harkens back to when the the Vikings drafted Justin Jefferson, another favorite of, I know a lot of people, but certainly myself in that draft. And then of course, Stefan Diggs was another one. I know he's like, what a fifth round pick, I think fourth or fifth. He was a guy I really liked in that draft. And it's like, man, I love these guys and I hate seeing them go in the division. Uh, But We'll see. You never quite know what's going to happen with a Chicago Bears quarterback. And uh, from a Packers standpoint, if you're looking for hope that he won't turn out, I think the biggest hope is that nobody turns out in Chicago at that position. Uh, But that even makes me upset, too, because this should be, in my opinion, a generational quarterback. And even whatever that means at this point, I know we throw that term uh, around way too often. But uh, I would want to see him succeed in the NFL in general, which, again, makes it stink so much that he's going to the Chicago Bears. But that is the pick, of course, in our mock draft. Number two. This might be the first surprise to some. We will see. The Washington Commanders 
select quarterback out of the University of Michigan, J.J. McCarthy. I do not believe that this is scout speak or like pre-draft, um, you just smoke. I think he has the ability. He's going to go top four, in my opinion, and I think he might go number two overall. And I should preface this by saying this is not what I would do. This is not 32 if Andy was the GM of every team. This is me trying to predict, which, of course, is a fool's errand in and of itself. I'm going to end up getting like three or four of these right, and one of them is the most obvious in Caleb Williams. But if you're sort of reading through things, I don't think it, it doesn't seem like Washington is really in on Drake May quite as much. And I it just feels to me that J.J. McCarthy is going to be the one that these teams fall in love with. I do think there's a lot of risk in Jaden Daniels. And I think coming from a pro offense, going to a team like Washington who needs maybe a, a stabilizing presence. Now, whether they're going to get that from McCarthy will remain to be seen. But this is my first surprise. I do, by the way, I watched a ton of J.J. McCarthy. I really like him. I understand some of the angst and, and some of the usage rate and things like that. There are two plays back-to-back -back in the red zone in one game where he throws right at a defender in a horrible pass, and it goes incomplete, and he comes back on the very next play and throws a brutal interception. There's some stuff on tape. There's a little Baker Mayfield there. There's a lot of Matt Ryan there, in my opinion. I just think these teams are going to fall in love with J.J. McCarthy, and understandably so. The pro-style system, his ability to hit all areas of the field, by every account, he is somebody that has a lot of respect and just like has an aura about him. I'm going to go J.J. McCarthy, number two, to the Washington Commanders. That brings us to number three, the New England Patriots. Will they trade out of the pick? Will they stay at the pick? New England stays with the pick, and with the third pick overall in the NFL draft, the New England Patriots select quarterback out of LSU, Jaden Daniels. There's been some rumblings that the New England Patriots have liked Jaden you know, Daniels, and I, I, there was also some rumors that Belichick loved Jaden Daniels, and that's who they were hoping to get. Now, who knows if that carries over to Elliott Wolf? There are some trade options here for New England as well. Let's just be real. They need a quarterback. I know they get, you know, the, the stopgap quarterback, but they need a long-term option. Jaden Daniels is my QB4 in this draft. Now, there's things to love. He throws a beautiful ball. He has all that athleticism. I didn't like for all the stuff that uh Caleb Williams gets about like being more chaotic and, and you know, just not going through everything. I, I feel that way about Jaden Daniels. Like I said, the ball is perfect. I, I thought he won benefited from the unbelievable wide receivers and playmakers that he had in that offense at LSU. But number two, I saw a lot of first read and then scramble or first read and drop eyes and start buying time and start doing stuff. And I wanted to see a little bit more of first read, second read, third read and going through those progressions. And a lot of rookie quarterbacks don't have that coming out of college. But I saw it with J.J. McCarthy. I saw it with Caleb Williams. I saw it with Drake May. I didn't see it quite as much with Jaden Daniels. I am not comparing Jaden Daniels as a prospect to Brett Hundley as a prospect. But coming out, that was my big concern with Brett Hundley is you go back and watch UCLA. Now, this was a extreme example of this. Malik Willis was another one where it was literally first read and it wasn't there and it was run every single time. First read run. There's a reason that he had like such a high touchdown interception ratio. It was, if his first read was there, he was throwing it because it was open. And if it wasn't, he was just taking off running. There was no like bad mistakes to be made. He was basically just an either or that the, um, you know, if then, you know, series of events was just not that long. It was literally if receiver open throw, if not run. And I, again, it's not the exact same with Jaden Daniels, but there is some of that. But again, at the same time, the upside stuff, the unbelievable speed and athleticism, and as a runner, what he brings to the table, and then just throws to all layers of the field with touch and accuracy and just a beautiful, beautiful ball that he throws. So much upside still. I do think there's a little bit more of a floor there, but I'm going to say New England Patriots take Jaden Daniels, the quarterback out of LSU at number three. Number four, we have our first trade. And we are going to have the Minnesota Vikings trade up with the Arizona Cardinals. They're going to trade pick 11, pick 23, next year's first round pick, and their fourth round pick this year for Drake May and a fifth round pick this year. So uh, that's what we're going with. I, I think Minnesota is going to be extremely aggressive to moving up to this number four spot, maybe even number three to New England. The crazy thing about this is, I think in this scenario, everyone kind of gets what they want. And what I mean by that is I actually think Minnesota wants Drake May. I actually think New England wants Jaden Dayton. I think probably everyone wants Caleb Williams, but once that part of it's over, I think Washington is sort of the tipping point here. If Washington takes Drake May, 
Then things get a little bit more interesting. I still think uh, in that case, New England takes Daniels, but then Minnesota probably moves up to four for, uh, in that case, JJ McCarthy. If the commanders in that, you know, were to take Daniels, then I think it gets interesting where maybe Minnesota moves into three and takes their preferred quarterback and maybe New England moves back and then we see what happens at four. But in this case, I actually think the Bears get Williams, which is who they want. I think the commanders after that, like McCarthy, they get who they want. The Patriots are hoping for Daniels if if uh, Caleb, of course, is not there. They get Daniels and I think Minnesota wants May. Remember, uh, Josh McCown, their new quarterbacks coach, was Drake May's high school coach. And they there's a lot of connections there to Drake May in Minnesota. They get up to to pick four. We know they've already acquired that pick 23 to be able to do some of this stuff. And they're going to be able to go up, get that quarterback, have their franchise QB. They give up a lot. Three first round picks is a, a pretty big price to pay. They give up a fourth rounder as well. They get a fifth rounder back, but they get their guy, Drake May, quarterback, Minnesota Vikings, who, by the way, also, I love Drake. He's my, he's my number two prospect in the draft. So not super thrilled as a Packers guy that my number one prospect is a bear and my number two prospect is a Minnesota Viking. But that is the way that it is sometimes. Number five, Los Angeles Chargers. Select wide receiver out of Ohio State, Marvin Harrison Jr. All right, so they trade away Keenan Allen. Justin Herbert needs some targets. And this just feels like a Jim Harbaugh pick. And I know Michigan guy taking Ohio State guy, uh, that doesn't always feel right. But Jim Harbaugh is going to be somebody that played against Marvin Harrison a ton, is going to know exactly how difficult it is to stop him as a wide receiver, and he's going to want those blue chip sort of guys. And there is no bigger blue chip guy in this draft, especially at this point at number five, than Marvin Harrison Jr. And he's going to be a perfect fit within that offense. He's going to take over uh, for exactly what Keenan Allen left off at and even probably be as crazy as this might seem to say a better version of that, which Keenan Allen is a absolute bona fide star. Uh, but I think Harrison's going to come in, be really, really good right away, make a major impact and be that big time target for Justin Herbert. Number six, we have another trade. Arizona Cardinals who trade out of that fourth pick overall and went to pick 11 uh, in that trade where Drake May went to the Minnesota Vikings. They go from pick 11 right back up to pick six and they take the wide receiver that they want in this draft Number six overall, wide receiver out of LSU, Malik Neighbors. In this trade, they give up pick 11 and pick 35, their early second rounder, to the Giants to get pick six. They lose Hollywood Brown in free agency. Listen, Kyler Murray, if you're going to want him to succeed in the NFL in any real legitimate level, he's going to need some playmakers. Malik Neighbors, my third prospect in this draft. He is an absolute stud. Yes, I have him over Harrison. Yes, I have him over Adunze. He has every ounce of unadulterated speed that you want. He's a good route runner, good hands. I, I see DJ Moore as his comp a lot. I think he's a much better version of DJ Moore coming out of college. I think he's going to electrify an offense from day one. We've seen what some of these wide receivers can do to supercharge an offense. Um, you, you know, with all that speed, we see what Miami does with those speed wide receivers. Arizona needs that. They play on that fast track. I think that's going to be the perfect fit for neighbors. And you're hoping that. Uh, they can combine together with Kyler Murray to start putting together the semblance of a really good offense. So pick six, Malik Neighbors to the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, Giants again move down to pick 11 and pick up a second round pick in doing so for a team that desperately, desperately needs some more talent on their roster. Getting a, a high second round pick uh, is super beneficial for the Giants in this situation. And for the Cardinals, they picked up pick 23 right? From the Vikings in that trade. So yes, they lose their early second rounder, but they move up to pick 23. So they move up from pick from round five to round four, from round two to round one. And they still pick up that extra first round pick from next year as well and get the guy where if they stayed at pick four, I think they take neighbors anyway. So getting the guy that they want, moving from the second to the first, the fifth through the fourth and picking up a future first is a home run draft so far for Arizona. It's going to get better by the way, spoiler alert. All right, so that brings us to pick number seven, Tennessee Titans. They select offensive tackle out of Notre Dame, Joe Alt. They have been building around Will Levis, getting him some offensive weapons that he needs. Tony Pollard at running back. Uh, they've gone out and spent a ton of money. They get Lloyd Cushenberry at center. They're trying to do everything they can to support Levis and make it so that if he can succeed, he will with some weapons. I still think he needs uh, a, a better offensive tackle. They got Nicholas Pettit-Friere at left tackle and Dylan Redunes at right tackle. 
this is a situation where I think Alts can come in and play left tackle from day one. And then you've got Petit Friere and Redouins to fight it out at right tackle. And if Redouins doesn't win, he has versatility to move inside as well. I think this gives Tennessee a much better offensive line. They get the consensus number one offensive line, uh, offensive lineman, excuse me, in the entire draft. And again, somebody to protect Will Levis's blind side moving forward. Number eight, Atlanta Falcons select edge rusher from Alabama, Dallas Turner. This is easy. Their edge rushers are Arnold Abikiti and Lorenzo Carter. That's it. Like they need better pass rushers. Grady Jarrett's not getting any younger on the interior of that defensive line. They need playmakers. They need studs and they need it on defense a lot. You know, they have AJ Terrell at corner. They've got some good players with Grady Jarrett on defense, uh, Jesse Bates at safety, but they need some pressure up front. And I think this is going to be a big time player. He's going to like, he has the fastest first step at edge it's absolutely incredible and crazy and now he's going to play on that fast track in atlanta this is a perfect fit for dallas turner and something that the falcons they've spent a lot of money and time effort and energy on that offense in the offseason so far this is something to get them a little bit of help on that defensive side of the ball number nine chicago bears it keeps getting worse for the green bay packers and and maybe just guys that i really really like in this draft are going to nfc north teams which is just brutal the chicago bears pick nine Select wide receiver out of the University of Washington. I'm rolling my eyes saying it for those of you who are listening on the podcast. Roma Dunze. I love Roma Dunze. It would not shock me at all if he was ended up being the number one wide receiver out of this class. There is some Devonta Adams to his game. There's a little bit of Terrell Owens to his game. There's a little bit of Keenan Allen to his game. There's a little bit of just like comp after comp after comp of amazing wide receiver. Can win at every single level. He's got size, contested catch ability, but he can also separate a little bit. He's got that alpha mentality and talk about a Chicago Bears team. You talk about supporting a young quarterback, something that they struggled to do with Justin Fields. They've got Caleb Williams at pick one. They trade for Keenan Allen. They've got DJ Moore and now they got Roma Dunze. You've got Cole Komet. They signed Gerald Everett and they signed DeAndre Swift in the backfield. That is a group of freaking weapons. DJ Moore, Roma Dunze, Keenan Allen, Cole Komet, Gerald Everett, and DeAndre Swift to go with Caleb Williams. Darnell Wright, their first round pick at right tackle. They've got a pretty decent offensive line. That is an offense that is set up for success right now. And we're going to see what Caleb Williams has with some very, very talented players on that offense. Number 10, New York Jets. Select offensive lineman out of Oregon State, Talis Fuaga. And this is actually a pick that I really, really love for New York. Now, a couple things here. One, they trade for Morgan Moses to be their right tackle. That's fine. I actually like Morgan Moses, but he's at towards the end of his career. He's a fine right tackle, but he's probably bottom tier starting right tackle. And I believe that Fuaga will be able to come in and compete at that right tackle spot right away. Now, some people project him as guard long term, which is fine. Um, they have two guards, Elijah Vera Tucker and John Simpson's that John Simpson that they just signed in free agency. So they probably don't have the need for the guard. But again, having him be able to compete right away with Morgan Moses at right tackle, and in my opinion, easily win that job. Have Morgan Moses then as your swing tackle to back up. And remember, Tyron Smith is their new left tackle. He has struggled with a variety of in injury issues. The entire New York Jets offensive line forever has struggled with injury issues. They get Simpson in the offseason. They get Tyron Smith in the offseason. Now they get Fuaga. They have not only better players, better offensive linemen, but now they have some depth as well and some versatility. They've got weapons. They've got Brees Hall. They've got Garrett Wilson. They've got uh, enough with Aaron Rodgers to go out and compete. And if they get Mike Williams from the Chargers in free agency. They have far more than enough. Just protect Aaron Rodgers because he's not young. And we saw one hit on the wrong surface and he's done for the year. So you got to do a better job of protecting them. I think this goes a long way in doing that. Number 11, New York Giants select Terry Arnold, cornerback out of Alabama. I think you partner with last year's first round pick, Deontay Banks. New York doesn't have a lot going for them at this point. I think the nice thing here is that they've already moved back. They pick up an extra second round pick. And now you've got the foundation of something on the back end of that defense. And this offense is in need of a major turnaround. But, you know, you could take a tight end here, but they still have... Uh, you know, Darren Waller, who is not yet retired, and you have Daniel Bellinger backing him up. So, uh, you know, Brock Bowers could have potentially been a pick. The top wide receivers are already off the board. You know, they have, they've spent some money and, and some, uh, I should say more, some draft capital on, on some offensive line. They went and got John Runyon Jr. in the offseason. I, I think that this is going to take more than just one draft pick to fix that offense. And in the meantime, 
I think what you need to sort of do is keep superpowering that defense up to give you something and to give you bookend corners for the foreseeable future. And Terry and Arnold and Deontay Banks, I think is really smart. And it probably just gives you arguably the best player on the board at this point. And again, they also pick up a second round pick in the process. So like this for the Giants overall. Number 12, we have another trade. The Denver Broncos trade with the Dallas Cowboys, a big trade down. Now, Dallas has been completely quiet throughout the entire offseason. They make their big move here. They go from pick 24 to pick 12. They give up their second round pick, pick 56, and a future third round pick to the Saints. So the the Broncos, we know, they need to recuperate some long-term talent. So picking up a uh, you know, the, the 24th pick, picking up a second rounder this year, and then a future third round pick as well in order to move down 12 spots, I think is going to be ultra important for Denver just to start stockpiling some young players again. Dallas, meanwhile, moves up to pick 12 and they get one of the best offensive tackles in the draft. I think he's right there with Joe Alt for best offensive tackle in the draft. They get Olu Fashanu out of Penn State. They lose Tyron Smith in free agency. They have Tyler Smith there to kick out to left tackle, but that probably puts TJ Bass as their starting left guard, who was an undrafted free agent a season ago. This puts Tyler Smith back at left guard where he's been playing, gives you that really great left tackle, protects Dak Prescott, keeps that offense going, and really gives Dallas, in my opinion, a pretty premium player. Uh, not expected you know, for, for Dallas picking at 24. They don't have to give up a ton. This is probably cheap for moving up 12 spots. I think it makes sense, actually, though, for both teams. And Denver picking up the second and third. Dallas getting that premium left tackle. Like it for both sides. Number 13, the Las Vegas Raiders select wide receiver out of LSU, Brian Thomas Jr. Yes, I think he has every right to go this early. He is Martavis Bryant without the off-field issues. He has all of the, you know, the, the speed to just absolutely blow past you. Speed for days, like easy acceleration. He stacks you and then he's just, you're just done. You're toast. And he's going to make a ton of big plays in the NFL. Teams then play off of him and he just takes those easy catches and then also has the run after catch ability. He's a super fun player. Teams die for this type of long speed that can open up everything and you have to keep your safety over the top, which opens everything underneath. Teams perfectly with Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers in the slot. Whether it's Aiden O'Connell or whether it's a quarterback that they get in this draft at some point, they're going to have a young quarterback and you need to give them weapons. And Brian Thomas is a really great weapon to give them at pick 13. Pick 14, New Orleans Saints take tight end out of the University of Georgia, Brock Bowers. They've got Juwan Johnson at tight end. They've still got the Taysom Hill experience, but this is a freak tight end who is probably falling a little bit here to pick 14. Listen, I'm not a huge Derek Carr guy, but if you are going to be a Derek Carr guy, you better give him some weapons that are going to open easily. They've got Olave on the outside. Now you've got Bowers at tight end and you've got Kamara at running back. Those are three really unique pieces that know how to get open, know how to separate, and you can use them in a variety of different ways. The Saints offense will do so. Like that pick a lot for New Orleans. Pick 15, Indianapolis Colts. Select cornerback out of Toledo, Quinion Mitchell. They love their freak athletes, maybe even more than Green Bay does, which is saying something. They have Dallas Flowers as one of the starting corners right now who's coming off of a, I believe it was either ACL or Achilles. I think it was ACL uh, from a season ago. He's going to have to come back and it's not like Dallas Flowers was his household name at corner on the outside. Anyway, this gives them a legitimate starting corner opposite Julian Brent's their day two selection from a, a season ago. And I think they're going to go out, get a big time athlete at a huge position of need. This is a very Indianapolis Colts pick. Quinion Mitchell corner at pick 15. All right, number 16, we have another trade. Seattle trades pick 16 to the Los Angeles Rams for pick 19 and uh, pick 99. So they give up a third round pick, end of third round pick. It's a third round comp pick and pick 19 to move all the way up to, or I guess up three spots to pick 16. And with pick 16, the Los Angeles Rams select Byron Murphy, defensive tackle out of the University of Texas. Easy. They lost Aaron Donald. They need to replace it. There's two defensive linemen in this draft that are really, really good. I believe these defensive linemen are going to be prioritized because it is getting harder and harder to find these interior pass rushing defensive linemen right now. I believe that Byron Murphy will be a big time selection. And I think that the Rams moving up to get him at 16. Now you have a little bit of strange bedfellows here with Seattle and Los Angeles making deals, but we've seen this Green Bay dealt with Minnesota to go and get uh, Christian Watson. We saw TJ Hawkinson traded from the Lions to the Vikings. 
this isn't as much of a deal, especially when you're trading pick for pick. It's one thing. It's like, you know, Chicago's not going to give up like the first overall pick to a divisional team or things like that. But in these sort of situations, 16 for 19, they're all players that are going to be graded pretty much the same around those spots. But the Rams get a replacement for Aaron Donald and Byron Murphy. Number 17, we have another trade. The Arizona Cardinals with that pick 23 that they picked up uh, in the Drake May trade from the Minnesota Vikings. They trade up from 23 to 17 and they give up pick 66 and pick 186 to move up to pick 17 to get, in my opinion, the best player left on the board and somebody that probably fell a little bit too far in this scenario. And Arizona is in desperate need of pass rushers. So they select defensive end slash edge rusher out of Florida State, Jared Verse. Arizona, it's just too good of a deal to pass up. They go up and get, to me, a top 10 player in this draft at pick 17 at a huge position of need. It's a home run selection. Yes, you give up some capital at pick 66 and pick 186 to do so. They have all the draft capital in the world. It's time to start turning that into premium players. They get one here in Jared Verse at pick 17. At pick 18, Cincinnati Bengals. What I just talked about, prioritizing defensive linemen, uh, especially those that can get to the quarterback on the interior. They select defensive tackle out of the University of Illinois, Jerzon Newton, and they have BJ Hill and Shelton Rankins at defensive tackle. They need some youth and they need some pass rush ability at that spot. They get it in Newton. These, Like I said, these defensive linemen who can get pressure are getting harder and harder to find. This is a great pick for Cincinnati at a big position of need. It's worthy of the pick. I know this is probably one that from a consensus standpoint, I think he's probably more, I don't know, mid to, or I should say like 25 to 32 range. Just think this is a premium position. And with, um, you know, Byron Murphy from Texas already gone, I think he's going to get valued that much more. Cincinnati takes him at pick 18. Pick 19, the Seattle Seahawks take offensive lineman out of the University of Washington, staying in his home state, or at least the state he's been playing in, Troy Fotanu. They get an immediate starter at left guard. Fatanu's interesting. I do think he has long-term offensive tackle ability. Seahawks have two offensive tackles right now, but this will give them some versatility. I think he arguably could become the best left guard in this entire draft. Um, there's another one that we're going to talk about two picks from now. Again, spoiler alert. Uh, but I think he gives them, again, an immediate starter at left guard, a lot of versatility, and is arguably the best player on the board remaining here. Seattle moves down. They pick up a third-round pick in the process for just moving down three picks and still get a top-tier offensive lineman in Troy Fautanu at pick 19. Pick 20, Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm sorry, Packer fans. Take defensive back out of the University of Iowa, Cooper DeJean. This is a, you know, as much as we talk about uh, DeJean being a uh, Green Bay Packers pick. He's very much a Pittsburgh Steelers pick as well. He's a playmaker in the secondary. He'd be a super fun pairing at safety with Minka Fitzpatrick if they wanted to do it that way. They also don't have a great option in the slot. I think he ends up in the slot in Pittsburgh. They love their playmaking secondary players. He fits perfect. He's going to give them a ton of versatility. Him and Minka in that same defensive backfield is going to give them a lot of playmaking ability. Of course, Joey Porter Jr. as one of the outside corners as well. This is a Steelers secondary that's getting better and better with all those pass rushers up front and Highsmith and TJ Watt. They're going to be a tough defense to, to work against. We'll see what uh, Justin Fields and Russell Wilson can do on that offensive side. But defensively, DeJean makes a, excuse me, DeJean makes a ton of sense for Pittsburgh. Pick 21, Miami Dolphins. Take offensive lineman out of Duke, Graham Barton. They've got Isaiah Wynn at left guard. They've got Aaron Brewer at center. They lose Robert Hunt in free agency. This gives them somebody that can play all five positions along the offensive line. I think uh, Barton's going to hear, like, the stock for Barton's going to continue to go up and up and up. His, his testing at his pro day was absolutely through the roof. And he, to me... Joel Batonio is the name that comes to mind when I watch Graham Barton. I think you're getting a Pro Bowl left guard. He fits in for that Robert Hunt uh, loss in free agency to Carolina and love this pick for Miami and gives them a big time player on that offensive line. Number 22, we have another trade. Tampa Bay Buccaneers trade pick 26 and pick 92. So a third round pick to get up to pick 22. They also pick up pick 172 in this trade. Tampa Bay Buccaneers select corner out of Clemson, Nate Wiggins. They traded away Carlton Davis. Zion McCollum is their you know potential starting corner on the outside right now. This gives them a playmaker on defense. Of course, they've got Antoine Winfield Jr. at safety as well. I think he fits perfectly in Tampa. I think he's going to give uh, that Tampa Bay defense a burst of speed at the outside corner position and a playmaker at that outside corner position. 
We know Todd Bowles is going to be aggressive. You better have cover corners. Wiggins is exactly that. Struggles a ton against the run. He's a good tackler when he's in coverage, but he's not against the run at all. But overall, I think they'll be able to cover for him there. And meantime, he'll be able to cover for them on the back end as a really, really good outside corner. Um, not, I'm not going to say a shutdown corner, but he's got a ton of high-end corner skills on the outside. Number 23, Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, who moved down in the draft, they pick up Kool-Aid McKinstry, cornerback out of Alabama. This feels like such a Jacksonville pick. It's not always the guy necessarily that you're expecting to go. They move down in the draft a little bit. They have a need at that outside corner spot, and they go and get a player from a big-time school, which is a very Jacksonville thing to do. Ronald Darby is currently set to potentially start in that spot. This gives them a big-time upgrade. They kind of just go get their guy. They don't really care what the consensus you know, board says or anything like that. So they get Kool-Aid McKinstry, corner out of Alabama, who I think is also, by the way, just a really good football player. So he goes to Jacksonville at 23. 24, remember, Denver Broncos moved down from pick 12 in that trade with Dallas. They select quarterback of the out of the University of Oregon, Bo Nix. I think this needs to be their pick in the first round. I don't think, though, that there's really much other competition in the first round for his services. So Denver does well here to pick up a second and third round pick in the trade. They move down to pick 24. Don't have to pay Bo Nix quite as much money as they would if they picked him at pick 12. They get their quarterback of the future, pick up extra draft capital, and hopefully start healing a roster that is in a really, really bad position at this point. Nix fits a Sean Payton system very, very well. I think he's a good quarterback, too. I like this pick for Denver at 24, and we'll see what he can become and if they can get something out of him uh, as being the fifth quarterback taken here in the first round. Pick 25, the Green Bay Packers select. Just kidding. They make a trade. They trade with the Kansas City Chiefs to pick 32. They pick up pick 95 in the third round in the process uh, and only give up pick 25 to do so. Um, There's not necessarily a huge, you know, just like eye-opening player that's on the board here for Green Bay. Uh, a lot of the top offensive linemen are gone. Uh, you've got Cooper that's gone. So I think they move down. You know, maybe they can target a linebacker or safety if they want. I think there's still going to be plenty of offensive linemen there at pick 32. In the process, they pick up another third round pick. We know Goody's going to love that. That's also going to give them a ton of versatility in the second and third rounds to move those picks up and use uh, maybe even, you know, a couple thirds to get up in a mid second round pick if they wanted to. Uh, but in the meantime, the Kansas City Chiefs select. Wide receiver, Adani Mitchell, wide receiver out of Texas. Uh, Rasheed Rice just has that whole incident going on. They could use wide receivers anyway. And to me, Mitchell is a, a little bit of a Stefan Diggs sort of vibe to him. He's got the ability to win deep, short, intermediate, and gives certainly Patrick Mahomes a big time target and a replacement for Rasheed Rice, depending on what happens with that situation, or a great tag team partner with Rasheed Rice if Rice is able to play this upcoming season. I'll just be honest, I haven't followed that situation closely other than seeing that uh, there was a whole situation, uh, but we'll see what happens there. Either way, uh, wide receiver definitely in play and going from 32 to 25, giving up a third and getting you know easily to me the best receiver still on the board uh, makes sense for Kansas City either way. 26. Philadelphia Eagles, they select Edrin Cooper, linebacker out of Texas A&M. This is an interesting one. They, they don't have a ton of needs right now. They're, they've filled out their roster with all their free agent transactions pretty darn well. They could go Jackson Powers Johnson to fill in uh, for Kelsey, who obviously retired, and just kind of go from one long-term center to what would probably be another long-term center at that position. But everything that we're hearing is that the NFL isn't quite as high on Jackson Powers Johnson as the media and draft Twitter and everyone else seems to be. And they're set right now with Nicobe Dean as one of those linebackers. They go and get uh, you know, the the linebacker from uh, Tampa Bay, Devin White, as the other linebacker. But Devin White is probably like a one-year rental and Nicobe Dean hasn't proved anything yet. This gives them some additional speed. This gives them a long-term replacement for Devin White and somebody who probably on passing downs could play alongside or maybe even as the key guy on passing downs. I think he gives them a weapon at off-ball linebacker and could make some sense for Philly at pick 26. Pick 27, the Arizona Cardinals do it again. They get edge rusher, uh, Leatu Leitu from UCLA. They get three of my favorite players in this entire draft in Jared Verse, Leitu, and then... Uh, neighbors at pick six. Uh, they they did a phenomenal job in this situation. 
And they they not only go get a the, the in my opinion the best playmaker in the draft the neighbors they get two bookend edge rushers at a position that is in desperate need of some juice they don't have much going for them let's just be real Arizona is in a tough spot from a roster standpoint getting two bookend edge rushers that I think are phenomenal and then pairing that with a big time playmaker on offense this is a home run draft and they picked up an extra first round pick in next year's draft as well. This gives Arizona hope for the future, which is something that they don't have a ton of at the moment. I know there's injury concerns with Ladu, but this is their third first round pick. They've got a little bit of ability to be maybe a little bit more risky here, and they picked up a future first round pick as well. So they're doing a great job. And if the upside hits with Latu, they get somebody who probably could have been a top 15 pick here at pick 27. Pick 28, the Buffalo Bills select wide receiver Xavier Worthy out of Texas. They lose Gabe Davis, and I think they could use some pure, unadulterated speed on the outside. Well, Xavier Worthy certainly gives them that. We see these teams that are very much navigating towards super high-end, fast wide receivers, and we know that Josh Allen has an arm for days. This seems like a perfect match. A quarterback that fits with this wide receiver, a wide receiver that fits with the quarterback, great fit in Buffalo. And uh, with Stephon Diggs not getting any younger at wide receiver, I think this pick makes, and again, losing Gabe Davis makes all the sense in the world for Buffalo. Pick 29, the Detroit Lions select edge rusher Chop Robinson out of Penn State. Talk about a a kneecap, ankle biting, you know, Dan Campbell, Detroit Lions-esque pick. I think he pairs extremely well with Aiden Hutchinson as a edge rusher to begin with. We'll see if Robinson can develop into an all-around defensive end, but they've got Marcus Davenport maybe to play some of those early downs. And then you come in with a pass rush group and you've got Chop Robinson on one end, Aiden Hutchinson on the other. I think that could be a very dynamic duo and just fits what this Detroit Lions team likes to do. And he fits their personality very well. At pick 30, the Baltimore Ravens select offensive lineman J.C. Latham out of the University of Alabama. This is just classic Baltimore Ravens. This is the highest consensus board player left. This just always happens to them. They sit where they are. Some player completely falls in their lap at a position of need from a big time school. And they just sit there and they draft them and they laugh all the way home. They get a big time player here. They love those huge offensive tackles anyway. We've seen them do it time after time. It fits perfect. He gives them their right tackle to start right now. And it's a no brainer at this point. So JC Latham, offensive tackle, Baltimore Ravens, pick 30. Pick 31, San Francisco 49ers. They take another offensive tackle. They take Amarius Mims, tackle out of Georgia. Listen, that right side of the offensive line was probably one of the only weak spots. It wasn't like brutally weak, but it was still weak for San Francisco. They've got Colton McKivitz starting there. I like McKivitz, but this gives them a long-term play with much higher upside than a Colton McKivitz and gives them a lot more versatility and depth. I think he just wins the job immediately over McKivitz. And that, again, gives them a lot of depth at that position as well. So I love love this pick for San Francisco. I'm a huge, huge fan of Amarius Mims. I think he's going to be a really good player for a very long time. And last but not least, your Green Bay Packers at pick 32 after picking up a third round pick and uh, moving from pick 25 to pick 32, they select offensive lineman out of the University of Oklahoma, Tyler Guyton. I've talked about this in the past. I think he is a very big time Green Bay Packers type selection here. There is some complications though. Green Bay does usually like offensive linemen that have played far uh, far more often than what Guyton has. He hasn't played a ton um, over the past couple of seasons. When he has played, he's looked really freaking good. Everything else to me fits Green Bay Packers here very well in the fact that from what they like to draft, he's young, he's super talented, incredible upside, ridiculous relative athletic score. He's an attacking offensive lineman, premium position player at offensive tackle, big time school at Oklahoma. It checks every box that they look for. And I think he's going to bring, again, a little bit of nasty. He's got, he runs like a tight end when he's out pulling. The only question mark here is, all right, where do you play him? To me, he's a right tackle. That's a bit of a problem, right? Because Zach Tom is a right tackle. Here's the thing. I think right now you need more talent on that offensive line. And we know Green Bay is very top five oriented. If Rashid Walker it ends up being your weak spot, which I don't think he's going to be, but if he's your weak spot, I think Guyton can move to the left side and it's not going to be a major issue. I also think Zach Tom can just move right tackle to the left tackle. I think it'll be totally fine and you can put Guyton at right tackle and just set those two, hopefully for the foreseeable future and have your bookend tackles for, I don't know, hopefully the next five, six, seven years. If it is uh, right guard, Sean Ryan, that's your weak spot. I think Guyton can play right guard. I don't actually have a ton of concern over that whatsoever. He's a little on the tall side for that position. I don't really care all that much. I think he'll get the job done and I think you can put him there. If Josh Myers is the weak spot, it's another one where you can probably just put Zach Tom at center 
And then you can put Guyton at right tackle. I don't love moving uh, Zach Tom off a of tackle if I'm just being totally honest, but this is Green Bay. They're at best five guys on the line. I think going from Josh Myers to Zach Tom at center is a massive upgrade. And if Guyton is as advertised, he can fill in and be a very, very good right tackle, uh, hopefully in the long term for Jordan Love. And in the process of getting this super high end prospect, who, by the way, uh, is a consensus 27th uh, player on the board that they get at pick 32. Daniel Jeremiah's 22nd rated player that they get at pick 32. They also pick up that third round pick in the process. All right, my big winners in this uh, draft, this mock draft that we did. First off, as much as I hate to say it, the Chicago Bears, they get Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze. This is a match made in heaven. They get two of my probably, what, five or six, seven best players in this draft, a big time wide receiver, the best quarterback, in my opinion, in a long time coming out of college. And it's the Bears, so maybe they'll still screw something up, but this would be a huge draft for Chicago. Again, as much as I'm, you know, vomiting in my mouth as I'm saying it. Arizona Cardinals, they get Malik Neighbors, Jared Verse, and Leatu Leitu. Huge, huge, huge draft for them. Plus, they also pick up a future first, and they end up with still with a guy that they probably would have taken at pick four anyway in Malik Neighbors. This gives Arizona some hope in the future uh, by getting these three players on day one of the draft. And the Minnesota Vikings, again, as much as it pains me to say, they're able to get up and get the quarterback that they wanted at pick four. They pay a price to do so, but they don't have much choice. Sam Darnold is on a one-year deal for a quarterback that you're probably not feeling super confident in. Jaron Hall is probably not going to be the answer long-term. They got to go get their guy. They're positioned to do so. Their guy just happens to fall to pick four in this situation. They get him. They pair him with Josh McCown, who coached him in high school. I think this is a great pick for Minnesota. Again, as much as it pains me to say it. And then Packers too, right? Like I like this draft for Green Bay. They get a big time offensive lineman. They move down, they pick up a third round pick. It's going to allow Good to be super aggressive. And if you just look again at pick, at pick 25 when you're there. All right, so Donnie Mitchell goes 25. Green Bay is not probably going there. Edrin Cooper goes 26. That could be somebody that Green Bay considers at 25, but that's probably even for Philly, a little bit aggressive at that point in the draft. I think he's probably more of an early round two, maybe late round one, maybe at pick 32. Uh, Leatu Leitu could have been a pick, but the injury concern probably gives Green Bay some, some concerns at that point. Xavier Worthy, wide receiver, probably not in play, not something they need. Chop Robinson doesn't meet their height weight thresholds. JC Latham, I think is going to be oversized for what they usually get. Amarius Mims could have been, but like the difference between Amarius Mims and Tyler Guyton, you're, it's the same thing, right? They're both right tackles. That's the concern that they're going to have to probably maybe move around a little bit to get them in a position in Green Bay. And then there's, like I said, are you going to take a safety earlier? Um, there's not much else really to, to sort of kind of pick at that spot. Even if they stayed at pick 25, if they pick at pick 25, honestly, I'm, I'm probably looking at Tyler Geithner or Marius Mims anyway in that situation. So going to 32, picking up a third round pick, keeping that fifth year option open. If they're a really good offensive tackle, I think is important too. So I like this for green Bay as well. Let me know what you think. What did I get wrong? What did I get right? What did you love? What did you hate? Can't wait to see your comments below. Uh, of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Packet A Podcast. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All Pro members, Most Hated Minnesota, and PJ Wayne, John Wild, Shea Bradad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. Of course, make sure to check out those Packet A Podcast YouTube memberships as well. Always appreciate that. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.